Hey everyone, so today we're going to be going over some SAT predictions for the upcoming digital SAT. So the first problem here is just going to have to deal with equivalent expressions. All right. So this problem says which of the following is equivalent to 1 minus P times 1 plus P plus P squared. I'm not going to read all that, but you get the point. Um, and so these problems, you can really just go ahead and, you know, multiply everything out. But that's just going to take way too much time when you're, you know, low on time on the SAT. You're just not going to have time for that. So you have to recognize patterns. So you can see here that all the answer choices have a coefficient of one in there. And that makes sense because, you know, one times one is just one and no other values will give you just a coefficient by itself. Everything else will be in terms of P. And now we actually have to determine what that P value is, right? So if I have this one and I distribute it to all these values, I'm going to get one times one. I'm going to get one times P, one times P squared. So you can see that all this right now is just going to be my final value, right? Everything is just going to multiply by one. And therefore, that is what I'm going to be left with. So currently, I have all these p values on the uh, in red right here. And so now, what I have to recognize is that all these are positive values of p, but my answer choices are negative values of p. And that's because I need to account for this second variable here, this negative p. Right? I have to distribute it out to everything. So when I distribute it out to the one, I get a negative p. Right? When I distribute it to the positive p, I get a negative p squared. And so I'm always going to have one value above the positive value, right? So what I mean by that is when I distribute this out, I'm going to get a negative P distribute. I get negative P squared and then I get negative P times positive P squared. That's going to give me negative P to the third. And so when you compare the powers, you can see that here, this is a power of one. This is a power of two here. It's a power of two. So now it's a power of three. So it's always going to be one above it. All right. So, if I just count the number of variables I have, I can uh, find my final value. So this right here is one pair. So that's one, that's two, that's three, that's four, that's five, that's six, and that's seven. And therefore, I know my final answer here is going to be B. All right, so this is a super common SAT English question that has to deal with grammar and is very likely to show up on your SAT exam. So it says, in 2018, a team of researchers led by Dr. Caitlin Whalen compiled every available measurement of ocean mixing rates from the past two decades. With this novel data set, the team is able to determine how current driven mixing varies across blank and what impact it has had on the distribution of heat and nutrients in the ocean. The question says which choice completes the text so that it conforms to the conventions of standard English. And we have all, all of our answer choices in terms of regions. All right, so the first answer choice I'm going to cross off, which is completely wrong, is B, right? We do not use a colon in this uh, text. And why is that? Well, Usually, typically use colons for either explanations or lists, right? But if we did insert regions colon, um, you have to realize that what comes here, what impact it has had on the distribution of heat and nutrients is not dependent on whatever we had back here, right? The current driven mixing varies across regions is not what determines the impact it has on the distribution of heat and nutrients. What determines this is the novel data set, right? So all of this, um, let's just erase this. This entire sentence right here in blue, that is one independent clause. Okay. And you have to realize that if I were to split this, what impact it has had on the distribution of heat and nutrients in the ocean, that does not make sense on its own. And therefore it is a dependent clause. All right. And that's for similar reason why we're going to eliminate answer choice C, right? Use a semicolon to separate two independent clauses. And like we said before, what impact it has had on the distribution of heat and nutrients in the ocean is a dependent clause and now we are down to two answer choices and these are probably the two that you might get stuck up on and that is either do you have a comma before the end or do you not have a comma before the end well this is going to boil back down to the dependent independent clause okay you have to realize that um you have to read within context essentially right so with this novel data set so you're using the novel data set and you're able to come up with conclusions, right? So with this novel data set, the team was able to determine all this, right? And with the novel data set, they were also able to determine what impact it has had on the distribution of the nutrients, right? So therefore, A is wrong, right? If we were to insert a comma right here, what that would imply is essentially that what comes after is a independent clause, which is not true, right? It's a dependent clause. Um, and so an independent clause would work on its own and have a separate idea Whereas, like we said before, with this novel data set is what actually determines the impact it has had on the distribution of heat and nutrients. So since those two actually coincide with each other, 
Our answer choice is going to be D. There is no comma before and. All right, well, so my next SAT math prediction is going to be dealing with basic statistics, and that is going to be probability. So this problem says on May 10th, 2015, there were 83 million internet subscribers in Nigeria. The major internet providers were MTN, Global.com, and all those other ones. By September 30th, 2015, the number of internet subscribers in Nigeria had increased to a value of 97 million. If an internet subscriber in Nigeria on September 30th is selected at random, the probability that that person selected was a MTN subscriber is 0.43. So 43% of that 97 million were MTN subscribers. There were P million MTN subscribers in Nigeria on that September 30th date. So this is interesting. So this information of 83 million internet subscribers in Nigeria on May 10th is irrelevant to our equation. Um, it asks to the nearest integer, what is the value of P? And let's remind ourselves P is the million of MTN subscribers that are on Nigeria um, on this date. Okay, so I'm going to be using not an accurate equation, but it just helps to, you know, think about it. So I'm sure we've all heard of part over whole, right? Uh, it's pretty common in chemistry. So we kind of want to think about it like part over whole. So if we think about it, the whole value is just what we have in total, right? And what we have in total right now in terms of all the subscribers, internet subscribers in Nigeria is 97 million. So just write 97 million there. And now we have to think about the whole, right? So our, sorry, now we have to think about the part. So the part is the number of MTN subscribers, right? So we know that the number of MTN subscribers is in terms of P, but P by itself is P million right? So what we really have is P times 1 million. Boom, boom, boom. Running with the mouse is hard. All right, so now what you have to understand about part over whole is that that finds percent composition, right? But we're not talking chemistry. We want to find the percent composition, quote unquote, of uh, MTN subscribers in Nigeria, right? So of that 97%, what percentage of those subscribers or MTN subscribers? Well, that information is given right here, 0 0.43, which translates to 43%. So we're going to give a value 0 0.43 here. So now it's pretty simple. We just have to solve for the value of P. Um, so to do this, you just plug it into Desmos, right? But first, let's simplify this out because if you type 1 million over 97 million, it's going to give you an error because it's just such a small number. Um, so over what we can do here is just uh, simplify, right? So we have P and then we just divide the 1 million by 1 million and divide the 97 million by 1 million. So we get P over 97 uh, equals 0 0.43. And so you just chuck this into Desmos. I re rewrote it differently, but essentially you just chuck it into Desmos and find the value of P or you can name it X. Find an intersection here we can see is 41.71. We want to the nearest integer the value of p, and therefore our answer here is going to be p equals 42. All right, so for my final SAT prediction for the English section, that's going to be these text structure and purpose questions. And the reason I include this is because a lot of times students treat this as one of those long paragraph questions where, you know, they get really caught up in it and it takes a lot of time. But if you really boil it down, these should go as quick as your grammar questions in some cases, and I'll show you why. All right, so mathematician Claus Shannon, blah, blah, blah. All right, so this part right here is just like introducing the person, right? You can see here his most important paper is a mathematical theory of all this, and it just goes on to explain what the paper is about. But because I'm not actually interested in the information, um, you know, grabbing specific evidence from the text, we I just want to describe the overall structure. All this right here is just nonsense that I don't need to know. Okay, so... What I have right now is we have this famous mathematician. He published a very important paper um, that did a bunch of cool stuff. Okay, now let's see what the next sentence says. It says Robert Gallinger. So we have a different person now. Um, it says one of Shannon's colleagues said that the bit was Shannon's discovery and from it the whole communications revolution was sprung. Okay, so this is interesting. So this is another perspective, right? So another uh, colleague or researcher or mathematician, whatever, um, take or perspective on uh, Claude Shannon's work. Okay, so which choice best describes the overall structure of the text? Without even looking at the answer choices, what I have is famous mathematician introduced, famous work that he had introduced, and then some other researchers' commentary on his work. 
So A says it presents a theoretical concept, illustrates how the name of the concept has changed, and shows how the name has entered common usage. Um, this makes absolutely no sense, right? So what theoretical concept is being introduced? None. We have a mathematician being introduced, so it's not A. B says it introduces a respected researcher, so it lines up, right? A mathematician is a respected researcher because it always says foundational figure, okay? Um, describes the aspect of his work, the important paper is the aspect of his work, and it suggests why the work is historically significant. All right, so does it suggest if it's historically significant? So what we have here is a researcher saying um, that his work was, and from it, the whole communications revolution has sprung. That sounds pretty significant to me historically, right? So I'm definitely leaning towards B, but let's read through the other answer choices. It names a company where an important mathematician worked, details the mathematician's career at the company, provides examples, an example of the recognition he's received there. Um, so this is really narrowing the scope, right? Our intro talks about the mathematician and how he's a really foundational figure, but it doesn't mention the company that he was employed at, Bell Labs, until the second sentence, right? And so C is really trying to push you towards, you know, his career at that company, which was literally just mentioned by name and nothing else. So it cannot be C. D says it mentions a paper, offers a summary of the paper's findings, it presents a researcher's commentary on the paper. Um, this is probably the strongest distractor answer, right? Mentioning a paper, which it does up here, a uh, summary, which it does, and presents a researcher's commentary on the paper, which, you know, you could, you could say it does offer that commentary, but I would say that this answer right here, D, is not as strong as B for this reason, right? You have to understand that when it says it presents a researcher's commentary on the paper, this entire answer choice is really focused on that paper, right? And while a big portion of this excerpt does talk about the paper, what it's really getting at is praising Claude Shannon as being just foundational figure in informational theory, right? When Robert Gallinger, the colleague, says Shan's discovery, so this is the only mention of sort of attributing it back to the paper, and from it, the whole communications revolution has sprung, that is really giving all the credit to Claude Shannon instead of specifically critiquing or praising what's in the actual paper, right? And B just works so much better with it, you know, introducing that respect to researcher, which D does not, right? D just says straight up it mentions a paper without mentioning, you know, the most important part, the main character in all of this, which is Claude Shannon. Therefore, our answer choice here is going to be B.